Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And what a treat we got today. The greatest Kiwi in the history of Kiwis. Do you hear that, Bushwaggers? Also has the best toupee in the history of the wrestling business. Five-time, five-time, five-time WWF champion, tag team champion, also tag team champion with the great Pat Patterson out in San Francisco. Then he became a road agent. He's got about a billion dollars that he has in his wallet, and he won't spend any of it. He's one of the best guys I've ever met, Mr. Tony Gurria. Tony, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, John. What an introduction. Oh, my God. You deserve every single say? bit of it. Tony, Tony man, you deserve every bit of it, like John said. Man, you know, you've, you've been around like me. You've been around forever. There ain't too many of us left out there. But, you know, we go way back. We go back to the damn early 70s, man, when we, we you and I. And just to, just to clarify things, Tony was born on September 20th, 1946. I was born on September 19th, 1946. But you calculate the time change and international date line and the stars are aligning with Mars and Jupiter and, and, and Earth. It comes out where you were actually born before I was. So you're the only guy <laughs> in the business that I know that's older no, than me. I worked it out. You're three minutes older than me. Well, man, that, that's that Kiwi time, man. You can't go like Kiwi time. There's no sheep around here. You know, so. mm -hmm. So, Tony, anyway, welcome to our show, man. You know, like I said, we we go farther back uh, than, than just about anybody I know in this business. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, they, a lot of people have left us. But, man, I, I met you in Auckland, New Zealand when I very first came to Australia. I think I'd been in Australia maybe for a month or so. And Jim Car Bardak said, hey, would you like to go to New Zealand? I can get you over there for a couple of days, you know, come back and. I think they sent me and Bobo Brazil over there, or me and me and somebody over there. I forgot who it was. Maybe maybe it's Killer Austin. But one of those big uh, uh, Madison Square Garden stars. And I met the great Tony Gurria, uh, uh, John. And Tony treated me with, with class, man. And I, we instantly became friends. And we've been friends ever since that, that, that night in Auckland, New Zealand. We had a ball over there. I was there for two days. And, Wonderful time. I fell in love with New Zealand and some of the, the young ladies over there, too. I might have to, have to admit, too. That <laughs> Tony, Tony, yeah, I'm, I'm sure his wife is in here. Did. Tony knew them all, though, because he had a head of full hair. Wait, he still got a head of full hair. <laughs> <laughs> but Tony, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the pre-meeting. Tell us a little bit about your head of full hair. Yeah, your head of full <laughs> hair. Hair full hair. My mother used to say, I'm going to lose my hair before I'm 21, because instead of a little dabble do you with that bro cream, I used to fill my palm up with that stuff and just rub it all over my hair. And uh, it, it was like, that was the Elvis Presley, Bill Haley era, you know, where Bill you Haley. had the, Hey, John, the there's, there's and, still hope for Bill you, Haley John. Kiss curl. Yeah. So, so there's still <laughs> hope for John, right? Oh yeah, there, there's a little hope there. You there's know, there's no there. hope for you, Jerry. <laughs> no, I, I'm I, I'm gone, man. So I, I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of. I'm proud of it, though. I got I got as much of a role I don't know time asked me, man. When I when I was young and I first noticed I was, you know, some of my hair was was disappearing. He said, "Hey, kid, you want you want, you want to save your hair?" And I said, "I'd love to, Sputnik." He said, "Get a cigar box." <laughs> <laughs> well, it took Gary a while to get that, John. You got it right away. It was, yeah, it took, Gary, it took Gary a while to get it. It did. It took. So I went and got me a big ass cigar box, and I still got my hair, man. I saved every every strand that fell out. But anyway, Tony, you know one of the great things we do here, we do a little bit of research on guys who come on, no matter how long we know them. I found something in your bio that 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 I flipped and said, you were a sprinter in New Zealand. Not, I knew you were a great rugby player because that, that makes you, tell us a bit, a bit, a bit about that uh, sprinting. Tell us a little bit about, about that teenage Tony Greer. What kind of athlete were you and and what what, what, were, what were you, you doing down in uh, New Zealand at the time? Uh, well, well when, when we were younger, we had athletic clubs and we used to go twice a week, you know, and we'd run, um, throw the discus, throw the javelin, uh, put the shot, do high jump, long jump, and stuff like that. That was 
that was part of growing up in New Zealand and then, of course, playing rugby in the wintertime. But um, I wasn't a, a huge sprinter, you know, but I was. I, you I were a up, huge sprinter. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah. But I, I built up a pretty good pace. And, you know, I think the best I did for 100 yards, I think I clocked it at like 11 seconds and uh, 11.2 seconds or something, you know. Right, right is, there with Hussein Bolt. With what? Hussein Bolt, the world's fastest man you were in no time. Time. Oh no! Well, he's no, from Ireland too. He's from I, Jamaica, and, and Tony's yeah, from New Zealand. So Ireland guys are fast. They're fast, yeah. <laughs> well, those sheep are pretty fast in New Zealand. You gotta be fast <laughs> to catch them. <laughs> Don't worry, get a scoop right there. So you were the chaser of sheep. Oh, I used to work with sheep when I was a kid. You know, it, um. Is that yes, where you got your is. hair? Is that where you got your hair from the sheep? Oh, no, no, no. There's no wool up here, you know. And you can't put the wool over a New Zealander's eyes because there's too much wool over them already. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke. Okay. So tell, <laughs> tell, tell, tell you, what, you weren't a great sprinter, but tell me, I know you were a great rugby player. You can't get out of that one. So that guy, kind of Tony Guerrero, you, you were a favorite there in New Zealand for, for your skills. Yeah, I, I played rugby uh, from when I was like five years old, and I played it up till I was, I think, 24, and then I left for the United States. But, you know, by playing rugby, that's how I, I used to work out with the weights. And back then in 64, that was a kind of a no-no. You know, you didn't work out with weights because supposedly uh, it made you muscle bound and you couldn't run and you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And now everybody's it's compulsory to work with weights if you're in any kind of sports now so i i played rugby and there was a couple of guys in the club that were professional wrestlers and they asked me if i'd be interested so they trained me and we had a piece of felt down on a wooden floor and that's where you took the bumps there was no ring you know, were there any rope? Were there any ropes? Did you have any ropes? No, the... we didn't have any ropes. Oh, you, you know, had one just a flat mat on the floor. Just a flat, a flat mat. It was like a, a felt mat. You know, the felt that they put under carpet when they laid carpet, and um, and that's where we trained. You know, like we took a slam. You took it on a wooden floor, <laughs> and like we thought, well, okay. That's well, it. What, was that was that better. was that like Steve Rickard group and all those? Yeah, people? yeah. Steve was involved, and actually, where I was, there was a guy by the name of Ernie Pinches. He done the promoting in Auckland. That's where who you worked for when you came over there at the well, YMCA. So, so how how long did you train uh, before you actually had your first match, and how were how was the breaking in process? And then the smartening up process back in those days compared to what they how they smart up guys today. Well, they didn't really smarten me up, you know. They just said I I was very loose and I locked up with the guy that was training me. He says, "Oh boy, you're going to be good," you know. And then you know he went through the motions, you know, a, a headlock, go behind, take down, and arm drag and grab the arm and. I just I just followed what he did, and I think I had my first match. Uh, I think I probably trained for like eight to ten months, and my first match was I believe beginning of August, nineteen sixty nine. Oh my God! Was water around then? <laughs> oh, no, no, it, it hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> yeah. Damn. You remember who 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 was uh, your worthy opponent that night? You remember? Oh, uh, that was Wild Don Scott. He was the guy that trained me, and unfortunately, he passed away recently. Mm. So, how what, what, did, did you ever? When did you learn how to hit the ropes and stuff? So you didn't have ropes in your training. Did you not get it, see ropes until you got in a match? No, I did. I didn't. Uh, yeah, that's right. I didn't. Um, we didn't use the ropes. Uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, like a crisscross or, you know, stuff like that. We just um, lent against them, you know. We didn't incorporate them in our match. Yeah. And I, I didn't actually get to use the ropes until I got to Australia. 
and that's when I picked up. Well, I know when when I came over and joined you in 1971 or whatever year it was, they they had a regular ring there. It was a stiff ass ring, but they had a ring with ropes and all that. Yeah, and it had four ropes on it. It was like a boxing ring. Yeah, it was a boxing ring. Exactly. Mm. That that was really, I mean, it was so so different to me going over there. And okay, first round you're going to do the second. What do you mean first round and second round? I didn't mm-hmm. understand the concept of of, of rounds at that time, John. It was, you 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 did it when you went over. I uh, worked for Otto over and 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 your folks. Did it. Yeah, it was strange getting used to, and the four ropes is really hard to get used to. But when you break in something like that, it just becomes second nature, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We had the uh, we had rounds for like three five minutes rounds. I think four five minute rounds, six six minute rounds. It was different. You couldn't actually build because what you had built would be cut off by yeah. a bell. And then you go back to your corner and gargle with some water. And first time I spit, there was sawdust in the bucket. And I spat and the sawdust come up, hit me in the face. I, I wasn't aware of it, you know. <laughs> Uh, Did you yeah, have a no. regular territory in New Zealand then, where you worked regular nights? Did you work several nights? No, no, no. It it was only part time. As a matter of fact, the promoter came to me and he said, I, "I'd prefer you not to play rugby, um, because you might get hurt." I mean, hurt wasn't even in my vocabulary back then. You didn't get hurt, you know. You were a rugby player. You just didn't get hurt. Even if you got hurt, you weren't hurt. And uh, I said no. So then he didn't book me for a while. And then he came to me about a year later and he said, Jim Barnett wanted somebody over in Australia uh, for about 10 days. So I went over there, green as grass. And uh, and uh, he asked me if I could stay, you know, for he kept me for eight weeks. And uh, I didn't do you know, the job that I was brought over there for. I think it was Bulldog Bob Brower, and I wanted to break my arm or some damn thing. I was probably too green, and and that's why. Or well, they, they want, uh, there, well, well, what, what you're saying, Tony, is that Jim wanted to do a program with you where, where, where they broke your arm work, yeah. work, work-wise and come back with Bulldog Bob Brown or whoever it was, right? Yeah, probably. I, I done a little something with Killer Carl Cox over there. He uh, what was that finish Killer Carl used? The brain, the brain buster. Yeah. The brain buster on a concrete floor in right. Melbourne. Ooh. And then we, uh, you know, they carted me off the hospital and then uh, I recovered pretty quick in about a week. And uh, I worked a few and time, times. And time for Melbourne to come back the following Saturday, right? Yeah, yeah. They Do they yeah, take but, you all uh, the way to the hospital? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you you had to work the hospital? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so what, did, did the doctors everything. not figure out that you weren't hurt? No. <laughs> they were... <laughs> They just went along with what, what I was telling them, you know. Well, being 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 a being a, being a rugby player, you probably had several injuries anyway that probably showed up. Yeah, well, well, could have done. Uh, um, I think back then, actually, I got more injuries out of wrestling than I did out of bloody out rugby. Of rugby. And it, wow, you know, I mean, I've had my nose broken, my my rib, my ribs cracked, you know. Ne- uh, ankles. Oh God! I had my ankles done seven or eight times. On so when you were, when you were in Australia, who was some of the talent besides Killer Carl Cox that was over there? I mean, uh, Jim oh, Barnett. They, Jim Barnett had a, a, a just a, a, a great talent roster. Oh yeah, he had uh, Killer Kowalski was there, um, Dusty and um, um, Murder uh, Murdoch. What's what was Dickie, Murdoch? Dickie, Dickie Murdoch. Oh, Dick, yeah. Dick Murdoch, Killer Carl Cox, Tiger Jet Singh, Bulldog Bra, Haystacks was over there. What, Jack, had, Is, Jack, had Jack been there or had he already been there and left? I think he'd been there and left. When did you first meet my brother, Jack? Was it in Australia or New Zealand? Uh, 
It would have been, uh, I think it was in 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 uh, Florida. In Florida, I thought you guys met in New Zealand or, or over there. No, I, no, I, 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 I know, I know. He he was he was a very strong mentor of you. He really really enjoyed the company, and you guys got along well. And, oh and, yeah, he taught me you, so much. You you patterned a lot of your lifestyle after my brother Jack. Then. Oh, I I I did, you know, and it, it was quite a compliment. If people would say to me, "I thought you were Jack Briscoe," you know. And uh, because, you know, we had the hair and we were about the same height. And, uh, oh, he was great, Jack. I mean, the stuff that he told me, you know, that helped me with my career. And one thing he said, I was feeling a little down because I was in Florida. I was there for like seven months and I averaged about $290 a, a week. I sent a hundred dollars back home to New Zealand, and uh, my budget was a hundred and twenty-five dollars a week. You know, to travel, buy food, pay the. Uh, I couldn't even afford to pay uh, an apartment unless I had somebody with me. And I said to Jack, I said, Jack, I'm just not making it. You know, we used to spend a lot of Sundays together, and. Uh, I said, I think I'm going to go home. And he looked at me in the eye. He said, Tony, if you go home, I'm going to come back there and bring you back. That's what he said, you know. And I said, oh, my God, you know, coming from Jack. So uh, needless to say, I stayed. And uh, then I talked to uh, um, Eddie Graham about coming to New York. And uh, was why, three... why New York? Why New York? Was that he had always no? Well, what it actually was, I met Tony Marino in New Zealand, and he came down down to Florida, and uh, he and that's what Tony me. had that toupee like you. Yeah, know, he had a cheap yeah. one that moved around on his head. <laughs> yeah. he, he he would go to sleep on the airplane sometime. You know how you kind of just slaps yeah. back. You know, you could always see when something happened to Tony because a flight attendant would walk by and just start laughing and pointing. Tony would go yeah. go to sleep and then his toupee would slip down where it was, his eyebrows and the flight attendant would start laughing. He probably did it on purpose. Yeah, just to get get to get some yeah. attention. Yeah. Get some attention. Yeah. yeah, but he was down there and he said, How you doing? You know, and I said, Well, not not too good money wise, you know, and he said, Well, uh Buffalo, New York with Pedro Martinez, you know. So then I mentioned that. Uh, to Eddie, and Eddie said, no, you, you don't want to do that. He said, but let me give Vince McMahon a call. So it took about three weeks, and then I walked in the office at the Sportatorium, and I said, Eddie, did you talk to Vince? He said, no. He said, let me give me give him a call now. And he booked me right there. Wow. Yeah. So how, yeah. How, did, how did you, let's back up a little bit more. Australia, your first place was San Francisco, where you went? How how did who who booked you there, and how what was your arrangement when you went there? No, no, no. My first place was Florida. Florida. Oh, I, had, I thought I thought yeah. you went there. Oh. No, Eddie Eddie booked me. Um, Barnett gave me Eddie's number, and we called it. And uh, there was a guy from Australia, um, uh, Johnny Gray. He came over with me, yeah, and we had our first match. Uh, March 20th in Orlando against J.C. Dykes and the Infernos. It was kind of weird. I, You know, coming from New Zealand to America and then... Well, how, how, how did that trip happen? I mean, did Barnett call Eddie or did you call Eddie? Or how, how did you get over to Florida? No, no, I, I called Eddie. Um, uh, Barnett, I think, uh, buzzed Eddie and said, expect a call from Tony Gurria, you know, because I needed to get a visa, a work visa. And I didn't think it was going to happen, so I was getting in shape for football, so I dropped about 15 pounds, and then the visa came through. So I said, oh, my God. And then I didn't have enough money for a round-trip ticket, so I borrowed some money on my uh, against my car. Now my car was worth about fourteen hundred dollars, and I only wanted five hundred, and they turned me down. I said, "Oh my God, I'm going over there. You know, I'm going to make at least five hundred a week, and all I wanted was five hundred so I could buy a round trip ticket." <laughs> and uh, 
and they gave it to me. So all the money in the world that I had, I spent on a t- round trip ticket to get to the States. And when I landed in Tampa, I had $200. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, that that was it. What and was I, your plan? What was your plan? You said you bought a round trip ticket. Did you plan on come, just coming to Florida, kind of seeing what it was like? And if you didn't like it, you had, you had that, that return trip in, in your back pocket, right? Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, but, but you needed a, uh, a ticket, you know, to come here with a visa because they wanted to make sure that you weren't going to stay. And uh, actually, my plan was to come over here you know, save about ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Go back to New Zealand and buy myself a pickup truck. And uh, I was in construction there. I'd done a lot of cement work at that time, and then go back and start my own business. You know, and uh, of course, it didn't quite work out. <laughs> so, what did you do when you landed in Tampa with two hundred dollars? I mean, that was. Did you get a cab to go see uh, Eddie? What What did you do? You didn't have a place to stay. No. Nothing, right? No, no, we didn't have any place to stay. But we, there was a hotel on Dale Mabry, and we stayed there. Hey, oh, there were a couple of Australian boys there. There was Larry O'Day and Bob Miller. Bob Miller, and and, and they kind of guided us, uh, guided us, you know, where to go. And then, of course, we had to buy a car uh, and end up, after being there about three, four weeks, ended up with a 66 Mustang for like $200 <laughs> and no air conditioning. Wow. And we used to drive, we used to drive, drive to uh, Miami. Well, you know the routine down there. It'd be Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm. They weren't short trips. And, you know, right through the summer, it was great. What an experience. You know, I had Bob Orton with me one time, Bob Orton Sr., Bobo Brazil with us. And where's the air conditioning? I had to wind the windows down or take it up to 70 mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> four, four, 470, they called it back in those days. All yeah. four windows down at 70 mile an hour. That was the AC. Yeah. 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 That was it. So when you went, so then you decided we went up to New York as soon as you talked to Vince McMahon Senior. Yeah, and what they did, they flew me up. Uh, at that time, he used to do three TV tapings, and he'd do it twice, uh, and then he'd bring you in. So I went up September twentieth, nineteen seventy-two, and done uh, three tapings. In Philadelphia, then we went to Hamburg, Pennsylvania, and done three tapings there. And three weeks later, it flew me back up and done the same thing. And then I started, I think it was October 29th, 72, in Patterson, New Jersey. <laughs> and I wrestled a guy named Joe Turco. Joe Turco, yeah. Yeah. And that's where it all started. Actually, the first. TV match was Davey O'Hannon in Philadelphia. How did you like Vince McMahon Sr.? Oh, loved him. Yeah, he was, uh, boy, when he walked into, into a room, you know, like his presence was just like, because he was like six foot three, six four, he had a three piece suit on, he stood straight up and down, you know. He was uh, a gentleman's gentleman. He was great, and, and he didn't say much, you know. He said to me one time, I, I questioned him. He said, Tony, as long as I'm alive, you don't have anything to worry about. You know, coming from a promoter, you know, it's like, yeah. holy Christ, who says that? So how long <laughs> was you there after that? <laughs> oh, I was there for two and a half years on my first oh, run. So, so I'm not trying to get to San Francisco where you teamed up with Patterson. Well, wait, 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 first, uh, was Vince Jr., our Vince, yes. Uh, yes. started doing commentary around that time. I don't remember, around 74, 75, something like that. Yeah, was yeah, Vince, he was, uh, yeah, I think he was doing the commentary and he was doing the interviews. He might have started with the interviews. I wasn't paying too much attention to who was on the commentary back then. What yeah, did, he, 
What was the thoughts yeah. then of uh, Vince Jr.? Was it just, hey, here's he's a nice guy, he's a promoter's son, didn't think much of him because he was just doing commentary? Or was there any specific thought about uh, Vince McMahon, our Vince McMahon Jr.? No, I, I didn't see anything. What well, You know, the thing is with me, you know, we're about the same age. Uh, he's a year older than me and Jerry. And um, it just, uh, you know, he had a different lifestyle. You know, I had my lifestyle and he had his. And, uh, you know, being the boss's son, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to be hanging too much with him or pushing myself on him, you know, say, oh, you're kissing the boss's ass, you know, like, but. Um, did did, did Vince okay. have it? Did did he have any position there besides commentator? I mean, was he ever you know given finishes? Was was he ever involved in the match making or other than than the TV? No, uh, no, not while I was there. But he had a couple of towns. He had Bangor, Maine, and he had uh, Worcester, and uh, was having a match. And he came over and he gave me gave me a finish for my match. You know, so. I did it, you know, it was all right. But uh, that was about 73, I think. Something like that. And those were the two towns that he promoted, were those two, Worcester and Bangor. Yeah, and it might have been Albany, New York. He might have had something to do there. As far as I know, you know, he might have had some other ones. I don't know. Was yeah, that the time? Yeah. Of, was that the time he had the Cape uh, Cape uh, Office Cape Coral? Oh, office, Cape no, US no, office. no. That was way before that. Way before you, okay? Yeah, I think the Cape didn't come along till the late seventies, early eighties. I might be mistaken, but I think it was about that time. You had to drive up there a couple of times. It was about one hundred and sixty miles from my house. You know, it wasn't a very nice drive. <laughs> We we still joke, uh, Tony, that uh, Arnie Scullin is still getting paid for White Plains. <laughs> <laughs> it probably was Arnie. Arnie was great. Oh, he was a tough old boy, you know. Was was Arnie? What 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 stage was Arnie in in his career? On your what? Would you repeat that? What stage of Arnie's career was he in? Was he in the kind of the, the later stages of his career when you when you were working? Oh with yeah, him? yeah. I I wrestled him a few times. I drop kicked him in uh, Pennsylvania in Harrisburg, and he went down, and because uh, it was like a baby face match, and he's holding his jaw, and I know it didn't hit him on the friggin' jaw. It hit him on the chest, you know. And I went down. I says, I says, Arnie, you all right? He said, Yeah, I'm all right, kid. Yeah, <laughs> he was good. I drove with him a few times. He says, uh, Tony, he says, uh, he's driving to Baltimore. You want to hook up? He said, we can have a few Jack Daniels. <laughs> I said, I said, I don't drink Jack Daniels. You know, I was pulling his leg. And he said, yes, you do. He said, we had that trip from Wilmington, Delaware. Up, up to New York, he said, and you were putting him down pretty good. You know, I was just busting his chops. He liked the, he chewed tobacco, never spat, <laughs> and he drank beer and Jack Daniels. Wow. Yeah, he swallowed the juice. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was always one of those guys who just kind of walked in and, and you knew this was somebody special. That was somebody. Oh, yeah. somebody, he just had that presence about him. Yeah, he told me that he he mentioned a couple of times when he was in Carlson's Raiders, you know, and he was he was only about seventeen, and he said he was scared as hell, you know. There were bullets going on, and and the drill and uh, the drill sergeant said to him, "Hey, kid, you scared?" He says, "Yeah, scared as hell." He said, "Can you hear the bullets?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "No, don't worry, you're still alive." <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he he was a um he was a boxer and a uh uh what do you call him not a circus a side those side shows fairs you know yeah. if you can stay in the ring with this guy you know you can win a prize yeah. arnie was yeah. yeah he was a tough old bastard yeah i knew he was i knew his reputation yeah yeah he had a good re he didn't say much you know, I seen him pull a guy 
Some guy attacked one of the wrestlers. He, he went under, he stuck his finger up his nose, and he just pulled him right off, you know? Wow. <laughs> he just pulled him right off the guy. Nobody could get him off and on. He went in there, stuck his finger, and pulled him out. And he had, he, he had fingers as fat as my thumb. <laughs> yeah. So how did you like your first run in New York? Did you did you enjoy it much more than you were in Florida? I guess you're probably making quite a bit more money. Oh yeah, I I, I think my first payday over a thousand dollars was uh, the second week in in uh, January, and I worked with uh, Curtis Iacare in the uh, in Boston Garden, and uh, I got paid six hundred dollars. I said, oh my. God, that was my biggest payoff, 600 bucks. <laughs> yeah, but it was good for back there. But I was, you know, to me, wrestling, it it, it was a, a job to me, and it was a way, you know, to save some money. So out you of that know, $600 you got, how much do you still have? <laughs> 605 <laughs> I, 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 I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony, you were there what two and a half years, two years, or and better. Uh, what made you leave? And uh, is that when you went out west? Or? Yeah, yeah. But Vince, uh, Vince says Tony, I, I think it's you know time you uh, you left here for a little bit. And I went down to Georgia for six months, and uh, and then uh, then I went out to San Francisco, and. Uh, I stayed in San Francisco for a year, and that wasn't. Um, I mean, the trips were short, and 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 it was good. I got to work out every day. Pedro was out there. Fuji was out there, and uh, Pedro and I we used to work out about three hours a day in Haywood at a gym up there, and it was pretty heavy weight, you know, uh, that we lifted. You know, slow workouts, but heavy. And then, you know, we'd be home every night, so there was wasn't a lot of road expense. I think gas was under a dollar a gallon then. I know the house, the houses around the apartment where I live, they were selling for about fifty four thousand, and now they're selling for about a million and a half, two million dollars. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Hey, Tony, isn't it amazing how weightlifting has changed? I mean, you, you listen mm -hmm. to stuff that Arnold used to do in Franco, and they'd work out for four hours a day, yeah. heavy weights, just like you guys did. And now these yeah. guys are training, you know, the, in spots, and the, they train quick and stuff. It's just – and guys mm -hmm. were huge and strong back then. Of course, they're huge and strong mm -hmm. now, but it just shows you that, you know, that, that overworking stuff may not be exactly what it's cracked up to be. Yeah, I – I, I think that I, I change everything. I go to the gym. I try to go to the gym every day down here in Florida, but I'm using the machines. And I do, uh, uh, like today, I, I do a warm up, I do some crunches, and then I do uh, shoulders, two sets for shoulders and two sets uh, for chest. And then I do some triceps, and that's it, two sets for triceps and then I'll change it up. I'll add a little bit of weight on the machine and I'll, I'll go up to from three sets of 10 to like six sets of six. And I put a little bit more weight on it, you know, but I just want to get out of the gym without getting hurt. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, That's right. The big thing, you know, uh, you know, and I'm not, I, I don't have to impress anybody but myself. So I don't use any heavy weights. I don't give a damn. I've done all that. God, Tony, I, Tony, Tony, Tony what, what a difference in, in administration. You, you leave New York where you work for Vince Senior, who really was a laid back person and not, not, real, not real bossy or anything. And you go to San Francisco and work for Roy Shard, who's in your face type of promoter. How how did you deal with it? How 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 did you see the difference in the two? Were they, the yeah. creative wise were they both the same creative wise, or how did you see the difference? There? Oh no no, Roy wanted everything there. You had to have like three or four spots, you know, in your match, and and almost every match was a uh, a mirror of the match before, you know. 
if you know what I mean. And then there were, but I, I liked Roy, you know, for some reason or other. You know, he didn't bust my chops or anything. But one time we were in, um, we we're in San Jose, and they gave you the TV matches for the next night. And he had me working against the local uh, boy, uh, Jerry Monty. Real good, real good worker. And uh, I said to Roy, I said, is this going to be a baby face match? He says, yeah. And he, he used to, you know, spit all the time. And he said, why, kid, can't you handle it? I said, no, I just want to think of some spots, you know, for it. Anyway, we had the match on TV. And uh, Roy was waiting behind the door when I left the arena at the television station. He said, Hell of a match, kid. You know, and guys were looking at me, looking at him, and they said that's the first time he's ever complimented anybody on a match. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was weird, but he told me one time he was he could take a hell of a bill, and I never forgot that. And I said to Jerry, I said, "There's going to be a spot in the match. I want you to bill me." And I'm going to go from one corner to the other. And that I think that's what sold him on the match. <laughs> I, hit, I hit my foot on the bottom turnbuckle on the opposite side. <laughs> yeah. Was that where you first got uh, to start a tag team with Pat? And were you guys put together right away? Or what was the reason for putting you and Pat together? No, I think, I think Roy just wanted somebody to uh, carry the belts for a while, you know. And um, so, uh, you know. Pat was there forever, and he was part. Uh, I don't know whether he was part owner, but he helped with the booking, you know. Uh, but Roy had the final, final say. But uh, I think they just put it, yeah, you know, just to carry it. I think they were the USA belts. I think they call them, yeah, USA Tag Team Champions. And. I don't even know who. We're, oh, I know. One time we wrestled Fuji and Sayedo in Sacramento for an hour and fifteen minutes. Wow! <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! The next day, I'm like, "Holy Christ!" I could barely move. <laughs> How was Pat back in? Was he was he very creative even at at, at that stage of his career? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, he'd talk about spots in the dressing room, you know, for us to do. But he put a little bit of, bit of, little bit of humor, a little entertainment in it, you know. And then when I was working with, um, uh, oh, God, he's gone blank. He, he was Pat's partner out there for a while. Ray Stevens, Ray, Ray Stevens. Yeah, Ray Stevens. And then I'd suggest to Ray, you know, a spot that I'd done with Pat. And he said, no, he said, you don't want to make the people laugh. That, that was, re you know, so it was completely opposite. You know, that's probably what made them so good because, they, you know, they were opposite. Ray was, to me, Ray was one of the best heels ever in the business. And, you know, that's my opinion. I mean, he I was agree with I agree with you. Yeah, I, I worked with him in the garden. It was unbelievable. You know, I put him over and... Uh, he was down on the mat selling, and I was up disgusted. You know, I I hit the top rope. I kicked the bottom rope with my foot, you know, and uh, and I was looking at him, and he had his hand over his, you know, he was down on the mat like that, and, and he, he moved his hand, and he, he looked up, and he spotted me, and he went, you know, he went backwards, and then I, I fired up on him, and he said, People came, he went back in the corner, I bailed him, drop kicked him, he took a bump out, and that was it. It was unbelievable. Was he just a great don't worker? Do or was... They don't do that anymore. There's, there's no time for people to absorb anything and to let it sink in and then anticipate what's happening next. Yeah, the, you know, you know, Vince to... McMahon used to always ex June, the, our Vince used to always explain to me, you, you got to let people react. You got to yeah. be able to do something and let have enough time for the guy sitting beside his wife or sitting mm -hmm. beside his buddy to go, wow, did you see that? And then react yeah. and then turn back, you know, and mm -hmm. I think now that can be what's missed when people are so worried about filling up the mm -hmm. match with action. 
Yeah, it, it's like it, when when I was an agent, you know, like uh, I would just say, "Go out there. Here's what we want," and I'd watch it. And if there was a mistake in it, I'd I'd tell them, you know, you made a mistake here, or how did you like your match? And they say, "Well, well, you know, there was a little bit here," and then. I, I'd correct it the best that I could, but I wouldn't say, well, you do this, you walk to the ring and you put your left foot on the step first when you go to the ring and you follow it by the right foot, you put your left foot in ring first. Oh, too much. Just the way I was taught, do what you think is right. And the agent would say, and if it's wrong, I'll tell you. <laughs> Oh, Tony, a, Tony, was, you you brought up something real important. Uh, uh, that, that, that if the agent, when you first went to working for Vince Senior, was there a bunch of agents handling the matches, or was it pretty well decided among the, the group of guys what you were going to do? No, no, no. There were Arnold Scullin was an agent. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon was an agent. Uh, Mario Savoldi, no, Angelo Savoldi was an agent. So. Uh, because I, I know, I know when you were here in Florida, it was Eddie and, and the referees yeah. were, were defending the ref. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we had the, them too, you know. You know, and uh, uh, they just tell you what they wanted. I, I remember with um, Gorilla Monsoon and Rick Rick Martel and I, we were wrestling the Samoans for the first time, and Monsoon said. Uh, I forget who was going over, but he said, um, just go in the room and talk it over. So uh, Rick had just come back from uh, Hawaii where Peter was over there promoting Peter Mavia, and uh, he was a little wary, um, you know, with the Samoans, you know, and I, I walked in, I, I, you know, I was there and uh, we were just looking at each other and I said, well, guys, there's a hard way and an easy way to do this. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to do it the easy way. So I gave them a scenario and I swear to God, they hurt us more in the dressing room after the match than they did. And we never worked with each other before, but <laughs> it went, it, it went wonderful, you know. Uh, I always, I always really enjoyed Gino having my match because Gino was like that. He, he mm -hmm. was, he, he, he wasn't more of a, a, he wasn't a control guy where he, you know, he would all right, you got to figure it out. But when you came back from the ring, he was one of those guys that set you down and walk mm -hmm. you step for step in a match and tell you what you did right and most mm -hmm. of all tell you what you did wrong. And, and and more importantly, how to correct that. I would I would yeah. really appreciate that at Gino. And in the little thing, Gino had more of the little 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 issues in a match that he could, he could tell you not to do than anybody I've ever I've ever had to, had the pleasure of, of, of working with as a as mm -hmm. under an agent there. I thought he was fantastic like that. But he was oh, more yeah. of, he was more of a field guy where it wasn't a control guy like you get some of these agents. They're just completely control guy, but where Gino you know, was just just a field guy. So. Yeah, he just just he, he told me you know a couple of things uh, on more than one occasion. You know, don't do that again. You know, don't do that. Okay, you know, do that. And he had a reason why he didn't want you doing it. So that was a good thing. yeah, yeah. Don't don't do it because he didn't like it. You know, no. it was just the wrong thing to do. You know, it's like when when I w was uh, a, a, an agent, there was uh, there was one kid there. He uh, he was working with Carly, and he took a he took a chop, and he went out of the ring by the corner, and within five seconds he was round to the opposite corner. And I told him when he got back, I said, "You just took a chop from a giant." I says. And in five seconds, you got from one side of the ring to the other side. He said, well, what should I have done? I said, well, just, you know, go outside like you did and stay there. Don't move. Listen to the count. And then when the count gets close, you know, get in at seven and just roll back out again. You know, sell that chop. And uh, that's what he did. It made 
the world of difference, you know, to the um, to the match. It was so easy, Tony, when I came to the WWE, when I had you and Jack Lanza as agents. <laughs> mm. You guys were fantastic. You know, you let us go out there and experiment and try what we thought would work. And if it didn't work, sure. you'd come back and you would tell us why why it didn't work, what we should try different. Mm. You know, and you, you, were, you were just like Jack. You said, I'm not sure that mm. worked. Why don't you try this tomorrow? Give us yeah. a chance. We try something different. It was just, it was, but it was a learning process the whole way. Yeah, yeah. I was, um, who was it? Oh, Duke the Dumpster, right? He was having a match, and there was one little part. He didn't segue to it, you know, just went from A to D type thing. And I talked to him about it, and he was bound and determined, you know, not to do it my way. I said, Duke, I said, please, you know, do it tomorrow. And if it doesn't work, forget I ever talked to you. Well, yeah, you know, I knew it was going to work. So he did it, and I seen it, you know, and the people reacted, and it, it made the flow of the match much better. And then when he came back, I was hiding from him because I know he was going to be looking for me. And then, then he found me. He said, did you see it? I said, did I see what? <laughs> he said, what we talked about last night. I said, no, I didn't see it. I said, how was it? He said, it was fucking great, he says. <laughs> <laughs> and then I seen him years later, you know, and he reminded me of it, you know, and he, he <laughs> hugged me and shook my hat, you know. And it, it's just little things, you know, I'm not trying to be a smart ass, but they just don't see it, a lot of these young guys. Yeah. You know? Mm. Well, you, you you had the pleasure of traveling, and I know you're you're cl very close friends and dear friends with 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 both John and I, a dear friend Jack Lanza. Tell us, do you mm. have any great Jack Lanza stories? Because Jack is one of the all time guys that everybody loves talking about. Everybody's got a great story about Jack, how, mm. how great of a guy he was. We we all three experienced it and saw up close what made Jack Lanza such a great guy. In your opinion, what was it, Tony? Well, I think he was just a straight shooter. You know, there was no uh, no messing around. You know, he had uh, he he just did what was what was right. You know, and um, we got we got on good together. You know, we traveled uh, oh miles and miles together over the over the years, and um, we never had a, a bad word you know, with, with each other. It was just, he, he was just a great guy, you know, and he had, um, you know, his private life. He was uh, very private with that. And he had invited me around to his house and we had breakfast there a couple of times when I was in the area in Minnesota. It's unfortunate, you know, he's gone now. It was probably you, to... him and Dave Hebner riding together, wasn't it? Or was that who it was? Yeah, yeah. We a lot of times it was just me and him because you know Dave would hook up with his brother. Yeah, at times, but um, but but Dave would come along too. He was, that, was some, uh, that was just some great cars back then because you'd have uh, you'd have Arnie and uh, Tim White together, and so because yeah. you know, all the young guys, which I was one then, we we'd, we'd pass them going hundred miles an hour. And they'd just be driving down the road, 55. They'd go about 57, 58. Arnie would be able to smoke it. They'd be drinking a beer. We'd pass yeah. them. We'd pull over. We had to go to the bathroom. They'd just keep going. We'd pull up, pass yeah. them again. We'd do that yeah. for hours. <laughs> but they were just, oh, they were just cool. It was just Tim and Arnie were just cruising down the road. It was, it was yeah. fun to watch, you know, to see the guys that, you know, were, were the generation ahead of you, the way they mm. act on the road. It was really cool to see that. Yeah, no, no hurry to go anywhere. And Arnie would have his ashtray full of cigar ash. <laughs> <laughs> it would never be empty. It would well, never he, be empty. He, he would take that stogie and he'd have an ash mm -hmm. on it, like a three inches long. The ash would be longer mm -hmm. than what was left of the cigar. And yeah. how he never lost that ash, I'll never know. <laughs> oh, I'll never know. Yeah. And those... Those cars, he used to buy a brand new car and he put about 80,000 miles on it before it had the first oil change. <laughs> or even a tuna, you know? He, he, he just run it. 
run it till it <laughs> till it wasn't running correctly, and then he'd send it into his mechanic, you know, and get it uh, get it fixed. Yeah, he was a character, all right? No more characters anymore. Yeah, it was uh, it was so much fun to be around and be and to see you know I was around when Grill was still there. It was just great to see the, all of this, you know, and to see these guys. They were just every one of them had their own mannerisms about them, and every one of them were just were just cool. They're just cool dudes. You know, I yeah. think Gorilla was the same as Arnie when he walked in. You knew he was somebody. Right. Mm. Some of those well, he guys filled up a room. Hell, he's three hundred fifty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He filled up a room with his personality and his size. There, uh, Gino was one yeah. heck of a guy and a very he, intelligent guy on top of it. Oh yeah, he was a hell of an athlete, you know, for his for his size. He he went to uh, Ithaca 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 College, I think. Right? Ithaca, yeah. And he was from Rochester. He told us a story one time. He went to Russia to fight this uh, wrestle this Russian guy, and he was a little worried about him. And they had to climb up on a platform. And, uh, and of course, he's climbing up, and the Russian guy is already there. And like Gino say, and he was huge. He was like a redwood tree, you know. He said, oh, my God, I'm going to get my backside beaten uh, tonight. And this was amateur. He said, and the guy came racing over to him, and Gino sidestepped him, and he went down and broke his arm. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He told yeah, me Gino, that. Gino was all American. He was he was he was quite a stud there at Ithaca College. He, oh I yeah, think, I think he's in their athletic hall of fame there for he, yeah, play. yeah. And then at Rochester um, War Memorial, he, they've got a plaque up there for him too. Yeah. Oh, do they at Rochester? They do. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. That was the worst building in America. That the oh, Freeman yeah. Coliseum down in San Antonio. Ooh, that Freeman, <laughs> I hated that place, man. That Freeman was such a piece of junk. Oh, smell! Yeah. I mean, you could smell that. If they had, oh, you had the cow lot right beside it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you came along right after that rodeo, oh, man, yeah. you couldn't breathe in that. There, oh, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> So Tony, after Oklahoma? San Francisco, what, where did you did you go back to WWWWF then? <laughs> Yeah, you left yeah, out one. Back, uh, yeah. I went back in uh, 1977. I was in San Francisco a year. And then I, I called Vince Sr. And uh, said, you know, just not making it here. And uh, he said to me, he said, Tony, do you think it's about time you came home? <laughs> I go, home? Christ almighty. <laughs> and... Uh, I was just talking about going home, you know, and um, so went back there and started up there again. Now, now the first run, had they won any tag team titles at, at your first run in New York, or was your first tag team title that went past in San Francisco? No, no, I had the, they put, uh, Vince Sr. put me and Haystacks together, and we took oh, the belts wow. of, Fuji, of Fuji and Tanaka. John, and, John, I think all of us young baby faces always had a turn with Haystack Calhoun as a tag team partner. My brother yeah. had a run with Haystack. I had a run with Haystack. Tony had a run with Haystack. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, 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 I think in the long run that, uh, that that's what kind of got me over with being with Haystacks because we wrestled Fuji and Tanaka in the garden for like 30 two minutes or something and I was in the ring for 27 minutes because <laughs> Fuji and Tanaka didn't want haystacks because they couldn't do a whole hell of a lot you know they started no. with them and then he he gave them to me and then we done some spots and then I just sold and made a big deal out of trying to tag the big man which is what they wanted and when they made the finally made the tag you know just blew the roof off the garden yeah so and i think that's what got me over that and was then, your first that was your first run with a second yeah and, and, and then when when he left they bought dean ho in because he had the martial arts you know that was anti uh uh fuji and tanaka and uh, we had a pretty good run, and then uh, they left, and then the Valiant Brothers came in. Yep. 
So when you went back to WWWWWF, is that when is that when is that when they put you with Rick Martel? Uh, they put me with uh, Larry Sabisco first. Uh, yeah, and I must have left. So was that you were Larry Sabisco after he did the stuff with Bruno, right? No, before he done the stuff with Bruno. Oh, before he did the stuff, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, trying to, and then I got with Rick, and then I think I think Larry and I we were against the Lumberjacks, and then Rick and I were against the Samoans and the Moon Dogs. Yeah, we had the first match with the Moon Dogs in Torrington, Connecticut, on Sunday night, and on Monday night we were going to be in the Garden. And that match was the absolute shits. <laughs> and I said to the guys, and, and you know, back, uh, I said, that was the shits. We're not going to make any money, you know, working like that. And I, well, I what, was screamed, wrong, what was wrong with the match, Tony, in your opinion? Oh, it was stiff. They you, you couldn't do anything with them. You know, one was 300 pounds, and, and the other guy was about 292. You know, and they just, we just couldn't do anything with them. And I, I explained, I said, shit. I said, we can't make any money like this. And the next night in the garden, it was like night and day. They listened again, which was, <laughs> you, you know, but I, you know, I was firm with how I was speaking to them, but I didn't, you know, you know, put them down or anything. I, you know, I just said, this was the shit. So I says, the people know you can beat the crap out of us, but we got to, you know, show that we have a chance. That was uh, the, the whole psychology of what I was taught, you know. Put the baby face over and then cut him off. Let him fight from underneath. Tony, Tony, back back in our days, back in those those days that you were tagging with all these guys, tag teams were treated a heck of a lot different in, in the New York territory. They were more of a featured type type match. You had your had your Brunos and your Pedros and your and your other guys that, that were mm -hmm. top guys, but they were always supported by very strong tag teams at that time. Then when when did that really start changing up up the, up in the New York area? That was probably <laughs> I got a funny story with tag team. It was probably when me and Vince Jr. took over. But one night we were in the garden, and Vince said to me, I was an agent there, and Vince was, a, you know, how Vince always come there. He said, Tony, why don't you put a single match on between the tag matches? I said, Vince, they're all friggin' tag matches tonight. He booked the whole show was a tag match. Oh, yeah. You know, there, there was about seven or eight of them, I guess. <laughs> And he asked me, you know, to put a singles match on, and there was no <laughs> singles advertised. Yeah, but I did. Yeah, when he came about, I think he eased up on the tags. Mm. And was that uh, was that around eighty one? That was that's when Vince Junior started. Taking, were you were you there during the uh, progression between yeah. Senior to Vince Junior? Yeah, I think it was eighty four actually. Yeah, and I, and I was yeah, I guess you're right. I guess he bought it. You know, earlier, yeah. but then the move happened later, I believe. Yeah, I think it was about 80, 84. And I was at the tail end of my career, and it was like, what am I going to do? You know, and then uh, I became an agent in 87, actually. Yeah. So, what was the difference between the two, senior and junior? Well, Junior was bring, bringing in all these guys. They were monsters, you know, and I was putting them over, and I didn't have a trouble putting them over. But Jesus Christ, I wanted to protect myself. I spent 90% of the time in the ring, you know, protecting myself, you know, and I still got whacked a couple of times. <laughs> but, um, I, like, I worked with Ted Arcidi, you know, and uh, we worked in Columbia, <laughs> 65,000. That, that was a work. <laughs> I said, Ted, listen to me. I said, and uh, I said, don't make a, a freaking move unless I tell you. And, and he went for, yeah, you know, he did. And we had a, a reasonable match, you know, it wasn't, wouldn't win any prizes, but uh, I didn't get hurt. 
<laughs> you know, Steve Simpson of the Simpson Brothers from South Africa, you know, her dad was a promoter. He tells a mm-hmm. story about Ted Arcity. He said, Arcity backed him into the ropes. He goes, all right, just relax, kid. <laughs> kid, I'm, I'm the worker. <laughs> God. I I work with I work with Bundy in the garden and that was about his first or second match you know for the WWF I believe and uh, they wanted me to go over and I had no idea how to beat him I you know I had the one idea in the back of my head so I asked a few guys you know and and Morocco said to me, he said, slam the big bastard. <laughs> I said, well, that's what I was thinking. You know, that was in the back of my mind. And uh, so we had the match, and I, I ran through a scenario um, before we went out. And uh, I went to slam him, and I didn't move him. And the crowd went, ooh, you know. And then... He worked on me again, and I, I done a little dozy do, and I came under, and I picked him up, and I fell back with him. And the crowd were, oh. <laughs> and finally, uh, I reversed the turnbuckle. Oh, he reversed the turnbuckle on me or some damn thing. Anyway, I moved out of the way, and when he came back out, I picked him up and slammed him, and it, it it was all based on the slam. I don't know if you could do that today and get the reaction we got there. What what did you think during during that time? I mean, you, you'd worked uh, in San Francisco. You had worked obviously in your home. You worked in Australia. You worked mm-hmm. Florida for the great Eddie Graham. And then all of a sudden, you see Vince McMahon, our Vince McMahon, starting up mm-hmm. WrestleMania and the take the buying of. You know, TV contracts, you got USA, WTBS, yeah. Hogan, Piper, bringing these guys all together in one place. What did you think about that? And did you realize that what he was doing was taking over everything at that time? Yeah, well, I realized he was taking over and then he was, you know, he was bringing guys in and they all looked good. You know, they, you know, friggin' huge, but, uh, you know. Their, their their working uh, ability left something to be desired, you know, and they didn't, a lot of them didn't want to listen, you know, because they didn't last. But um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then I heard, you know, that he put all his eggs in one basket for that big WrestleMania. And if it didn't go, you know, that was it. Whether was it was was that the word backstage uh, in the in the beginning of WrestleMania one that he had, that he invested the, the whole ball of wax in, in a one show was that the word did you guys I, have it? I don't know if I heard it there I heard it I heard it later you know I always that. heard it later because I was involved in promotion of WrestleMania one and cold circuit and yeah. I never I never once heard. Of course, I was remote and I wasn't around all you guys, but I never, mm-hmm. you know, I did the house shows and everything. But I never once heard that Vince has invested his entire jackpot in this. If we don't make it, we're out. I always heard that this is, you know, just the positive side of. It. I always yeah. wanted in, in, in house because you're 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 backstage with those guys a lot. Was, was that mm-hmm. was that the word going around that you know? Wow, if we don't make this, and we're out. Yeah, well. That's what I heard later, like I said, like after after the fact, you know, that because, you know, I would assume if if that was a fact, he wouldn't let it out, you know, before, you know, the show went. But uh, I think that first WrestleMania, I I think I was I was in Madison Square Garden, right? Right. right. And then I I was in Springfield at a remote. Springfield, Massachusetts. They had the remote there, and then I made it down to New York to the Rainbow Room for the after party. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, they had the big one in. Uh, was the after party there? I mean, would you describe that scene there? I mean, because we we've all experienced WrestleMania parties, man. Mm-hmm. There's there's second to none as far as layout goes. But how was that yeah, working? This was the first one. I think uh I I think Billy not Billy Joel, Billy Crystal 
he was there because I think he was involved, you know, in the WrestleMania. And I can't think who else, but it it it, it was was it was, was Ali was Ali there? Billy Martin, all those guys were there at the after party. Oh, Billy Martin, I think was there. Yeah, I think, if I remember rightly. But it, you know, it wasn't uh, wild and crazy like it got later on. You know, <laughs> it was just a, I guess, a tryout. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Was there talk at the after party about, hey, this was a huge home run, or did they know at that point because it was closed circuit and hadn't got all the feedback yet that it was such a big home run? Yeah, I, I think they knew it it was a home run then. That gave me the uh, – because that, you know, like I was only in Springfield, Massachusetts, and that, and that was pretty good, uh, pretty good showing up there. That was all new. What they call it? Closed circuit, right? Closed circuit back in there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, Tony, I know, I, I know Tony from running all the close circuit. You know, I was doing the promotions here in Florida, uh, and I had about twenty some odd towns, and not only in Florida but all the way up to Carolinas, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and, wow. uh, and then so I know every hour I was getting phone calls from uh, what was the old uh, the old accountant's name there? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. I can see him. Yeah, I was getting calls from him almost every five minutes. What, 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 what's, what's the count? What's the count? I yeah. said I just gave it to you. We had so five more tickets there. Well, wait, you give me the exact count again, so I could have it for the ball. I gave him the exact count again. Five minutes later, he called back. Well, have you? What? Uh, same thing. Fred. I don't know. I wasn't Fred. But, but anyway, well known. So, so Jerry, Vince, Vince was wanting a constant live update. A right? constant. A constant. I mean, almost. Got down to to the nut cutting time, and I mean it, it was it was I'm not I'm not lying it was every ten five ten minutes I was getting a call from somebody from from the office accounting department wanting to know what the count was and they were sitting right next to Vince because I could hear Vince in the background you know well this one's really good this one sucked you know and mm-hmm. we had some that sucked too. So. Did either one of you two guys think during that time? I mean, you know, you guys were both on the inside of Vince and also you had a huge tentacles into all of the other territories and new people and workplaces. Did, did either one of you think that there was a competitor that could have taken on Vince during that time? Was Crockett, uh, if Eddie Graham had been alive, or was anybody out there that you thought is a, is a viable competition for Vince? Mm. No, I – well, I – the Crockett's and and Vern Gagne, they had a chance to do it before. And Vince. Bill Watts and Bill Watts. Yeah, Bill Watts. Yeah, but um, you know, because the Crockett's were going up into Ohio, and they were doing uh, Toronto. No, that, that 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 was Georgia that was going to Ohio and Michigan. Was it? Yeah, that was. That, that yeah, was, I that, I thought that, the Crockett's went up, and and no. and, and Vern was going out yeah. to San Francisco and and yeah. Denver. Yeah, along 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 with along with Eddie, Eddie, Eddie and Vern were teamed up for that. They were going out. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, really? my 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 whole thought on it, John, is that you know uh, we we'd already had Starcade, Starcade '86 or something like that, and that was a huge mm-hmm. success. But that wasn't near what WrestleMania was, and it wasn't near what Starcade was projected to be. When Jimmy first started talking to to us, it was us being Jack, myself. Ricky and Jay and Flair, you know, it was going to be a closed circuit nationwide, but he couldn't get all the all all the the parts together at the time. So we ended up just closed circuit it there locally, you know, in inside the Greensboro Coliseum. There was a convention hall right next. They they put a screen up there, and I think in a couple of other places. And we had minimal uh, success doing that. And then you know, uh, come WrestleMania time. I, I know what I'm involved in. I see all the 20 some odd markets I'm doing, seeing what they're doing. I'm holy cow. And then, you know, in the background, as I'm getting these calls, well, how are they doing out, 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 out west? How are they doing it? And I'm hearing these box car numbers come in. I think, mm-hmm. oh, man, this this is it, man. This is awesome. This is what this is the future of the business. Mm. Well, that's what's missed a lot, right, Jerry, is that Vince was a logistics genius about this. Yeah, exactly. Because it was hard to get all of this closed circuit nationwide. 
and Crockett tried and was not able to get it done. Well, well, yeah, and, and, you know, being in New York and everybody, well, he, you know, he's in New York, he's at the hub of all this all this media activity so he could get it done more so than somebody in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, that was, that was the perception because of the media, because of location, 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 Vince was able to get all this done, but I don't think it was just location. It was Vince had had it up here, the, what, how to do it and everything. He had yeah. a vision in his head, how to do it. And Tony can back me up on this. Well, we're Crockett. It was just kind of a, kind of a, kind of a, I experiment with Crockett, I think, and I don't want to speak for him, but it was, they didn't have the research and development as WWE had in, in those days. So, and then Vince had, and even in those days, the research and development uh, department, R&D department for Vince, I mean, he, he had guys out there that, that had done the big boxing, pro boxing, because boxing was only really the only only form of entertainment that was really successful on these, on these closed circuit events. And, Vince took that entertainment perspective and 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 incorporated it in what he was doing. That was the difference to me. Just just the foresight and the and the preparedness. I mean, even up to the last week there in in Charlotte when when we were doing the the the, the, the Starcade, we really didn't know how many markets we were going to have if we we're going to have any markets at all. So it was, what what a difference it was in the preparation side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vince probably had some pretty good connections. He had one guy up there that was, I can't think of his name. Frank, Frank Serpy. Frank Serpy was the guy. Frank Serpy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was yeah. the, 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 the accounting guy that I have. Yeah. That I yeah. You know, an, another thing, you know, with Vince, when he started this stuff, he had to buy his television time. Yeah, well, everybody, know. everybody did, yeah. Yeah. And, and like it said, that Channel Nine in New York that went up, yeah, I think to four or five thousand dollars a week. And, and Tony, when they they were they were predators, the MTV stations were predators. You know, they mm. start out okay, you can have it for this. Then once they started seeing the success that Vince was having, man, that 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 kind of that that's what really hurt the territories too, because once they saw the success Vince was having, then all of a sudden those rights fees just started exploding. For professional wrestling on TV, where you're paying yeah. maybe a hundred dollars a week or a hundred dollars for per show, then the next time you you, you come up and now now you pay five hundred dollars per show. So that that really changed the the, the, the whole status of, of territorial wrestling too. Tony, when you were an agent, did, did you talk about the logistics uh, genius of Vince? There, there were there, Vince also did a lot of surveys. Was that done with coordination with what you were there as far as the audience and stuff? I think that's what's missed with a lot of people was the, the background searches and checks that Vince did with the crowd about what they enjoyed, what they didn't do. Mm. Were you involved in some of that, Tony, as far as your agent, or were you just, or you, did you just work just mainly with the talent? No, I, I, I work mainly with the talent and then uh, um, uh, and a lot of times with the uh, with the settlement, you know, of uh, and uh, I, I'd, I'd look at a settlement. I'd look at a settlement and, and if it was, something was out of line, it would just jump out at me, you know, like one time I was in Philadelphia and I'm looking and there was a a. a, a a credit card charge of fifteen thousand dollars. I said, Jesus, that's a lot of money. So I done the math on my uh, on my calculator, and it was exactly fifteen. But I still wasn't convinced. So I asked to see last month's, you know, and I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. And last month, it was a little less money wise. But the credit card charge was only about eight thousand. So I looked at it and I, I did the math and and then I mentioned to the people that were at settlement, which there was about five of us, I think, and uh, including our rep that you know promoted uh, Philadelphia. And uh, they looked, they looked at it, and they said, "Oh." We charge you for every ticket sold. So that was about a $7,000 overage, you know, that 
And I think the accountants, even if they had a got it, they would have let it go through because the you know everything matched, but it was wrong. <laughs> Tony, Tony ha, ha, ha. John, John, to answer your question about the surveys, that was done lo mostly through what well, not, well, not through the agents, but like the, the local promoters, like I was, Jay Breslov out on the West Coast, the guy up in the, in the Midwest. We were the ones, and yeah, you're right, man. We had survey after survey come into town, you know. We 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 got he got a database before databases were were yeah. you know the the thing to do. WWE had that database ripped right off the bat. That was one of the first things that that did the surveys. I don't know where he picked that up, up from, but uh, but yeah, it was it was mostly done through the building through the local promotions. There, not not agents. I don't even know if the agents were even aware of it at the time. Probably not. Uh, I I don't remember. Tony, Tony, how did you become an agent? I know you said you were near the end of your career. Who approached you about it, and what were your thoughts? And you know, and 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 your your opinion on being an agent? Well, actually, they were, I guess, looking for another agent, and uh, Strongbow uh, actually approached me. You know, he said, "What do you think about becoming an agent?" You know, I said, "Yeah, okay, I'll give it a shot," and uh, and he went to Vince. You know, and. Uh, and the next thing is, okay, Tony, you're going to try out as an agent. You know, it was a little bit, I was a little wary because, you know, I was one of the boys and now right. I'm going to be an agent, you know, so how much shit am I going to take, you know? You go, for, you go from office to boys. That, that's a different, yeah. uh, different, uh, uh, difficult situation to go through, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, but, I, you know, I didn't come on like, well, you know, if you don't, do what I say, I'll find you. I hated finding guys, you know, like I wouldn't find, I said, uh, for God's sake, you know, like you're supposed to be here, you're supposed to dress like this, you know, I talk to the guys and I say, well, I'm not going to find you, but sometimes I just had to, and I just hated that. And then when you went overseas, you know, like one time Vince said to me, it, it, there was evidently somebody, some car in the parking lot in Jerusalem or in Israel, in the hotel where we stayed, uh, some wrestler uh, supposedly knocked the rear vision mirror off, and then they put toothpicks in locks or something. <laughs> and, and Vince said, "Not the guys. Why would you keep an eye on the guys?" He said, "What do you want me to do? Stay up all night, follow them around? You know." <laughs> and, and how the hell would you know? They were wrestlers, you know. And then you had to be on the bus by eight o'clock to get going, and then. Some guys would drink that uh, German apple, some damn thing, and snop, apple snop, apple snops, yeah, uh, apple corn, apple corn, apple corn, yeah. apple apple corn. corn. Yeah. And, and, and that that been a distinguished mayor from Knoxville County, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he was on the bus, but his but his drinking buddy was taking a shower with no water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was either. I couldn't find the knob for the water. Yeah. Oh, it was you. Him and the bath. I'm sorry. <laughs> that dang apple corn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I drove by Knoxville, you know, the the other week, and I, I was thinking of Glenn, you know, and I said, oh, why not? I got to get a bottle of that and, you know, pop in and see him one day. I said, I got a gift from Bradshaw. <laughs> that's right yeah oh god we used to get that when we were working in germany together that was our that was the drink that they'd have over at a, a place called Anka's, which is across the street they let us uh, eat and drink for like six or five or seven marks or something like that all night you know to get, to get the fans to come in there you know so yeah. they'd, they'd let you come in there and, and they'd, they'd be begging to give you the apple corn to try to get you to stay oh god <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy being an agent? Yeah, I I, I did for the most part because we, you, the only part that got annoyed was when, the, you know, you'd give the guys something or you'd talk to them about doing something and they wouldn't do it because they thought they knew more than you, even though you've been in the business for 25 years and they were in the business for 25 months. You know, that's that's the thing that, used to annoy me the most but um i try to make everything you know go smooth and 
you know, what the hell, life goes on, so can't get too upset over anything. You know, it's not, uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, I'd have to call, where were we, in Germany, and Marty Gennetti left his friggin' passport in his jacket in the hotel that was like 25 miles away, and that's when we were on to Israel, but they found the jacket and they found the passport, so they were going to get it to us, but the plane was leaving. So I said to Marty, we'll get you a hotel, stay here, and we'll be back in two days, right? And then join the, he went home. (laughs) (laughs) He went home and was like, you know, there was nothing else I could do. You know, I have to make that decision. Okay, what do we do? Okay, we'll do this. And uh, so we continued the tour without him. <laughs> it's just, then, we lost a few guys overseas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember one time, I think it was July 2nd, and and we having a show in St. Louis, and it was snowing like hell. And we next day, we had to go to... Um, to Ohio, into Columbus for a double shot, and it was snowing, so the planes weren't taken off. So I called Terry Garvin. He was my go-to guy, you know, at the office. I said, Terry, we can't get out of here. The plane's not taken off. He said, well, let's rent a plane. I said, Terry, it's snowing. They're not letting planes take <laughs> off. Oh, my God. <laughs> this so we missed the Dayton show, but we got there for the Columbus show. Mm. You know what was always amazing to me was that there weren't more deaths on the road. You know, guys, guys mm-hmm. used to drive a hundred miles an hour, and we drove it all night long, oh. and and somehow we made it. <laughs> it just, yeah, it beats the odds of what should have happened. Yeah, and in all kinds of weather, you know, like oh my god, to- yeah. I drove. I drove in a snowstorm from New York to Rochester with. Um, oh, I can't think who he was, and uh, I drove the whole friggin' way. It took about seven hours. I couldn't do over fifty-five mile an hour because oh, yeah. I'd lose the car. Eddie. Oh. those trips were, were absolutely miserable. I don't know the those conditions there. And, and without yeah. cell phones, without any way to contact anybody, yeah. I mean, you, you slid off the road. You're you're walking. You're in trouble. You're in trouble <laughs> in the snow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we got those blessed pages. Vince called me one time. Oh God, I hated those. He left a message on the pager. Uh, no, no, the pager went off. You know, oh, it's Vince. So now I got to find a telephone on the Jersey Turnpike. So <laughs> I call him, and you know. We get it done, and then I'm going down the road, and it goes off again. Now I'm down in Delaware. Now i got to get off and find another one, another telephone to call him. And I call I said, Vince, you page me? He said, yeah, I was just checking to see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's great. Man. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Tony, what what are you doing now? Besides collecting bottles and, and counting all your money. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm taking the tops off the uh, off the beer cans, you know, the little trip cans, because they are 100% aluminum, and they worth like 30 cents. Or um, <laughs> the camera. Uh, and, and that's about it. I kinda I'm kind of. i holding 30 cents in my hand here, John. You want me to send it to oh, you? Call please. Me 40, oh call me 45 cents to send it to you, though. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not really not doing a whole hell of a lot. You know, I was going to New Zealand every year, but then COVID hit, and um, that put the kyber on that. And uh, you know, I've got my brother and sister down there, and uh, I I I invested in in properties, you know, when I was working, and I I sold most of those now. So I'm just down in Florida, and I work out, and I eat, and I go to happy hour and tell some lies, and then, <laughs> then I go to the uh, to the um, Cauliflower Alley or the uh, uh, Waterloo, Iowa, and 
and Don't that's, about, that's about all I do. Just waiting for the dirt nap. <laughs> you, you, you're 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 enjoying retirement. I know over and on the on the east coast of Florida, uh, you're well known over there. I've got some friends that own bars over there, and they tell me they see you always asking for a sample. <laughs> that's right, a free sample. <laughs> Uh, well, Tony, I, I got one place I go, you know, and I'm not there every every night either, you know. Okay. But there's a a few people over there that I've met, you know, and we have a bit of a laugh and you know bust some chops, and it's pretty good. Tony, pretty if you good. had it had it to do all over again, would you would you would you uh, you you trade in that old uh, Ford Mustang or that uh, you had over in New Zealand buy that six hundred dollar ticket again? Would you do that all over again if you had a chance? Yeah, but it, it probably would. But you know, I think back and said, how the hell did we do this? You know, no cell phones, no computers. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, are, are, aren't you glad that there was no internet back when we were? Oh yeah, ago? <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, after they, Jerry, after trying to hook up Tony to Zoom, he doesn't have internet now. Ah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This has all been done on my uh, <laughs> uh, uh, on my iPhone. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And you stayed on the entire time too. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, Tony, well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you know, James Beard is okay. my good friend, and, and he he's uh, your good friend as well. He I keep up with you a lot through James. So uh, yeah, yeah, James is a good guy. Yeah. Okay, guys. Yeah, it's been good. Jesus Thank you, Tony. Talk.